it, would you be able to give an outline of um, uh, metabolism as seen through the eyes of these great scientists who really were onto something? Um, yeah, starting in 1900, uh, the idea of electrons in molecules was uh, really just being explored. Uh, uh, it was about 1930, 35, uh, when mainstream chemists started accepting that there was such a thing as a free radical. But in 1900, Moses Gomberg at the University of Michigan had produced a stable free radical, uh, which uh, with uh, a free but uh, un fairly unreactive electron uh, produced a deep purple color with a very uh, small amount of, of the molecule in solution. And uh, this started other chemists thinking about uh, what produces color in molecules. And over the next four or five years, uh, several chemists were uh, theorizing about uh, mobile electrons in uh, molecules like um, benzoquinone. Um, and these were really the, at the center of mainstream chemistry. But uh, even the average uh, university chemist uh, wasn't up to date. Uh, on uh, the theories of electrons. It was only in 1916 that Gilbert Lewis uh, uh, gave his theory of electron bonding, and uh, then Niels Bohr, uh, I think it was 1921, uh, described his uh, picture of how electrons orbit around molecules. And then uh, several years later, uh, Linus Pauling uh, uh, gave a, a more detailed description of uh, how electrons work in chemical bonds. So uh, the very best biochemists were uh, just getting started around 1935 thinking about electrons. Mm -hmm. And uh, biologists and uh, medical doctors uh, couldn't uh, imagine how electrons could have anything to do with uh, <laughs> the life process. Uh, so the, the process that uh, is involved in oxidation, it's the movement of electrons from a fuel, such as sugar or fat, to oxygen. And in the process, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of extractable energy in some form. And uh, when the, the uh, biologists finally uh, uh, admitted that uh, electrons had to be explained somehow, they wanted to uh, compartmentalize uh, how the energy is, is uh, used in moving from uh, glucose or fat down to oxygen. And uh, so they uh, invented little machines that would... Uh, uh, take a, a sort of a quantum of, of energy out of that moving electron and uh, uh, attach it to various little machines, which they called pumps mm -hmm. or motors and so on, and, and explained uh, muscle contraction and secretion and all processes uh, in this uh, very primitive uh, concept of biological energy, where the, the actual process is a, a flow uh, a streaming process. Uh, there, there's no uh, standing still for the electron. It, it, the mm -hmm. cell dies if it isn't uh, constantly moving uh, the electrons from fuel to, to oxygen. So this is a process that's going on every breath we take and every single cell in our body is moving these electrons from sugar or fat to oxygen. Um, uh, yeah, and w when you uh, try to measure the uh, electrical energy of a cell, uh, you stick a needle in, for example, to measure the, the voltage, and uh, people have a, a sort of a standing uh, static picture of the cell uh, in which it's a, a membrane, and inside there are statistically uh, um, randomized uh, molecules carrying electrons, and so uh, they think of it as a, e effectively a bag of 
electrons which they're measuring. Uh, what they're doing is disrupting this intricate constant flow from fuel uh, to, to oxygen, and they're uh, measuring uh, an injured cell every time they uh, try to stop it to fit their model. Uh, they're, they're destroying some cell process. And uh, in uh, the 1940s, uh, uh, St. Georgi uh, published some of his work with uh, oxidative processes in muscle and how energy is used. And uh, he was the one who discovered that ATP literally makes muscle contract. He, he extracted muscle and used various uh, simplified preparations to show that simply adding ATP made the muscle move. And he was thinking of something electronic going on related to oxidation and uh, uh, fuel use and so on. But he found that the contracted muscle in the presence of ATP uh, didn't break down the ATP molecule. That ATP causes muscle to contract without changing its bond structure. Well, this is very interesting, folks, when you, when you hear this. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you too much. So uh, muscle contraction can occur in the absence of the breakdown of ATP, which is not what I was taught when I was at school. Um, so anyway, yeah, most people that listen to, uh, to what you've just said now might remember that the uh, classic description is ATP is reduced to uh, ADP and AMP, and that r release of that phosphate group is what actually drives the muscle. But, Dr. P, you're saying that that is not the way it is. Um, uh, yeah, the, um, w when I was in graduate school, the uh, muscle biologists uh, all over the world were saying that ATP has a high-energy bond of mm -hmm. 11 or 14 kilocalories per mole, and it's that energy that can be used to explain the little muscles, uh, motors in the muscles that uh, uh -huh. cause movement. Uh, without that high energy, it would be impossible to explain their motors. But meanwhile, uh, Gilbert Ling had, uh, I think he probably read St. Georgie too, and uh, was aware that ATP didn't have to uh, break down to release energy. He uh, pointed out that the energy of the whole molecule of ATP sticking to the, mu the protein of the muscle has an energy of stickiness or absorption energy of 21 kilocalories per mole, uh, twice as much as the hypothetical bond energy. And that explains uh, why it makes the protein uh, change without having to break down. Simply, the relationship between the molecules shifts the whole structure 